there's just so much deliciousness to be had that doesn't have to be confined to this to, to the definition of Chinese food and certainly Chinese food in Australia. Today on Dirty Linen, we are talking to Jennifer Wong. She does not work in a restaurant. She does not even own a restaurant. She is a writer and comedian and she has made a show that I absolutely love on the ABC iView. It's called Chopsticks and Fork. It is all about food, uh, Chinese Australian food in regional Australia. Jennifer, welcome to Dirty Linen. Thank you for having me, even though I have not got a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all about food on this show, so um, you you definitely fit right in. But yeah, it is a bit of a different angle uh, from the conversations that we've been having recently, but that's a good thing. Uh, so, I mean, I feel like I would love to talk about chopsticks and chopsticks or fork, but I feel like you should be the one to explain what it is for anybody who hasn't seen it. Well, um, it's a show where the director Lin Ji Kong and I basically hop in a car or on a plane and go to six different restaurants in uh, regional Australia. Um, They're all Chinese restaurants run by people from various backgrounds and we ended up going to Moree and Malua Bay in New South Wales. In Queensland, we went to Harvey Bay and Atherton and we also went to a place in Darwin and a place in Gawler in South Australia. And... I mean, what to, what will people see when they when they watch the show? You will see a lot of delicious Chinese food that will make you think back to the days of honey chicken and Mongolian lamb and you'll probably want to eat a fried ice cream. We meet the families and we talk to them about how they ended up in the um, locations that they based their lives um, in and talk to some of the people who've been eating at these restaurants for years and years. We learn a little bit about how to make certain dishes like um, sweet and sour pork and deep fried ice cream. And it's just, it feels a little bit like a time travel road trip situation because for the people who've seen it, what I've heard is that it just reminds you of that first time you went to the local Chinese restaurant. Mm. It's so loving, you know, like I think you, you, you're so, your road trip is, you're obviously so excited about what you're, what you're doing and you approach these restaurants with, you know, such an open heart and you're really interested in their stories. It's just, there's a real joy in it. <laughs> I mean, how could you not be joyful knowing that at the end of your destination, a plate of sweet and sour pork is waiting for you? Like, I just don't know how you could <laughs> not be full of joy to, um, to, to be able to get that experience. Um, someone online commented that it wasn't fair that I had the best job in the world and at that time I was like, oh, yeah, it was a pretty sweet job, a pretty yeah. sweet and sour job. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Um, it's interesting that you say and a lot of the, you know, the people who've watched it have remarked to you that it feels nostalgic because, mm. I mean, it is in a sense like these are restaurants that have been there, you know, sometimes, you know, through three generations And they are these fixtures in these regional communities. But, of course, they're still contemporary. Like, it's happening right now. Yeah. It's a really interesting space that those restaurants occupy. And I have to say, like, I I felt like I'd been remiss in sort of uh, through watching your show, I felt like I'd been remiss in sort of putting a lot of those old school Chinese Australian restaurants into a bit of a retro box in my mind and not really feeling like they had much to do with where Australian cuisine is at today. But then I just thought, well, that is just a really dumb way to think, Danny. Um, you need to unpick those uh, those ideas and, and reappraise these restaurants, I think, with the kind of spirit that you brought to them. Well, Danny, I don't think you should be talking to yourself and saying that that's pretty dumb because, <laughs> you know, I think you deserve to be loving and kind to yourself. <laughs> but it's not that type of podcast. No, um, no, I, I know what you mean because I think if you live in like a major metropolitan area, whether you're in New South Wales or Victoria or Queensland, um, you know, when we think of Chinese food, it's – A lot of things have changed over time. You know, if we think about the different waves of migration of people coming here at different times. So these regional Chinese restaurants, we're talking about people that would have come in the 70s um, and set them up and perhaps not much has changed. But in the cities, certainly different 
people have come from different parts of um, China and Asia in general in the last, you know, 40 something years. And so now when you walk out onto the main street of, you know, Melbourne or Sydney, you could probably get yourself some pretty decent food from Guilin, from Sichuan, you know, from Shanghai, certainly. And so when we, we don't really think so much about honey chicken as the first kind of thing that comes to mind when we're thinking of getting Chinese food on a Friday. But depending on where you live, you know, you know, if you're living in Atherton, then honey chicken probably is front of mind on a Friday night when you're having a $38 banquet with your mates, you know, with a fried ice cream at the end. So I think what I learned from the show is that it's a really different experience growing up in regional Australia. And I know that sounds like a really naive thing to say, but I grew up in the suburbs of Sydney. And um, for me to go to these restaurants, I experienced a sense of foreignness. Like, Danny, I had never seen a prawn cutlet before. Oh, you were very sheltered. <laughs> Like, I, it, I didn't know this was Chinese food. Like, I thought it was a chicken, like, yummy drummy, like, from primary school with, like, a little kind of orange thing sticking out of it, which, of course, is the prawn's tail. Um, but I didn't know prawn cutlet existed. Like, I knew prawn toast existed, but I didn't know that a prawn cutlet existed. You know, I, I'd never had chicken cashew before. I didn't know that um, fried noodles in some parts of regional Australia meant that you're putting cooked food onto pre-fried noodles, like Chang's noodles, basically. Um, I didn't know that was a thing. So it's really, I think, depending on who you talk to, everyone's got a, got a story about where they had that first Chinese food memory form for them. And um, I think it's a really good Australian question to ask, like, what comes to mind when you think of Chinese food? I think it, it it is a great question, and I think it it's just it's definitely part of the Australian multicultural story. The way that these dishes have been adapted to circumstances, and whether it's a dish that was created in the seventies and just stuck, or whether it's a dish that um, you know now. I think one of the favourite restaurants that I've eaten at in the last year was a Chinese Indian Swedish restaurant in Mount Waverley in Melbourne, where the Hakka Chinese couple that run it. Uh, were, you know, they're Hakka Chinese background, but they grew up in Calcutta. The Hakka people had a hard time in Calcutta, so they moved to Sweden, as a lot of that community did. And then they ended up moving to Melbourne because Sweden was just a bit cold. <laughs> and That's amazing. Brought, yeah, so I think I feel like there's a, there's definitely room for a reappreciation of a fusion food, which has had a bit of you know that you know that even that term fusion food, it's a bit on, it's been a bit on the nose. But I think there is mm. definitely sense in in looking at it again with a perhaps you know a more um appreciative eye because it's the way that those those cultures are drawn together and those foods are adapted uh is definitely part of the story of i guess resilience in migrant communities but also celebration of the new cultures that are created and are always evolving and changing i think so i think um, one thing that hasn't changed since the 70s is our appreciation of food that's delicious. And the fact that all of these restaurants have um, lasted all this time is because what they're doing is pretty tasty. You know, like, you, you know, I'm not going to say no to honey chicken when you've made it with this, you know, delicious honey. You know, at, at um, Malua Bay, for example, the honey is local. It's from um, a, a nearby place called Mogo and it's just there's so many different ways of this cuisine um, existing in its own location in a really, really specific way, you know, depending on where you are and what you've got access to, whether it's really fresh seafood, for example, or in the case of the families who kind of um, have come here and brought their own culture that's not just the Chinese culture when you think about, like Danny, you mentioned the family from um, Calcutta with a Hakka background. Like we had two Hakka families in um, in the program and they each brought their own Hakka style to these Chinese foods, whether that meant serving um, pork with um, pork belly with preserved vegetables and taro in Darwin or, you know, adding some Malaysian sambal flair to their um, – to their um, luxes, you know, it's there's just so much deliciousness to be had that doesn't have to be <laughs> confined to this to to the definition of Chinese food, and certainly Chinese food in Australia. 
Yeah, absolutely. Was it um, the Gaula restaurant that had the Vietnamese family? Mm, yeah, that's right. So the Chems had um, arrived in Australia by boat. The um, the mum and dad actually met on the boat coming over here from Vietnam. And um, it's so cute. There's this gorgeous photo of their son, Vin, who's their oldest of two sons. And he's just like four years old he's reaching for the cash register trying to I don't know get some money to buy some fried ice cream or something but um (laughs) we see him now and he's you know almost 40 and he's grown up in this restaurant like the people that um come to the restaurant say that they've seen the boys through the good times and the bad times and both the boys now work in the restaurant in the kitchen in front of house and um they serve amazing food they've got a Penang beef dish there that's there because someone from Malaysia came through the kitchen one time and um you know showed them how to make this dish they they do lemongrass chicken as a nod to their Vietnamese heritage and what I can taste when I'm eating there is there's this lovely subtleness in the way that the battered dishes are cooked so it's not like a really kind of there's no heaviness to it like it, it almost feels like the temp, like the the battered dishes are as light as a tempura mm. so you know when you have your crispy steak and plum sauce you've got that beautiful texture from that light frying or that deep frying <laughs> but um but and the sauce on top just sits beautifully so it's it's kind of i feel like it's got a bit of a vietnamese touch in terms of the subtlety to the dishes um but yeah again delicious I love that there's there are so many family stories in the different episodes as well and and so much you know the the um the kids that have perhaps you know been in the restaurant from day dot but also the ones that have gone off and then been drawn back they're just um you really feel the sort of magnetism of these businesses yeah well um i think you're referring here to emily who runs um raymond's at malua bay with her dad raymond um and you know, she's in her thirties and she was working in Sydney in a marketing degree, in a marketing job. And basically when she was little, she was like, I am never moving back to Batemans Bay. I am never going to work in this restaurant. But then COVID hit. And like a lot of people, she was working from home and she was like, how much further up this career path ladder can I go up really? you know, do I really want to spend my days working at home like this? And at the same time, her dad, Raymond, um, was in the process of rebuilding his restaurant because it had burned down in the 2019 bushfires in Malua Bay. That's a really heart-wrenching part of that episode where he goes and sees sees that it's just not there. Yeah, and I think for any business owner, like certainly for any restaurant owner, the idea of something that you've built up over time um, he'd also just done a $200,000 refurbishment on the restaurant before it burnt down in the club. And, um, yeah, so basically Emily was like, I will never get the opportunity again to be part of a family business like this. And so she left her job. She packed up her life in Sydney and she went back to Malua Bay and now does amazing things at the restaurant like run it but also – add to the culinary um, experience of the locals there by putting deep fried ice cream with Nutella topping, (laughs) which I'd never seen before. Um, So, you know, it's, there is a really joyful sense of renewal, I think, in, in that particular story. Yeah. Definitely. So, I mean, there are thousands of these restaurants around the country. How did you land on these six? Well, um, so the program's made by the ABC and as you know, the ABC has offices everywhere so we asked people like where have you been eating you know what what do you love um tell us about the places that you love and we heard back from a bunch of people some people sent us articles about different Chinese restaurants that have been covered over time like there was um someone who used to work at a newspaper in Brisbane who'd set the challenge of um finding the the oldest um the oldest Chinese restaurant in Brisbane. So, you know, we had a few leads from that article as well. And then it was just a matter of making calls. So um, a lot of the um, restaurant owners spoke Chinese as opposed to um, English, like they speak English as well, but they felt more comfortable speaking in Cantonese. So a lot of conversations in Cantonese, trying to persuade them to let us come during COVID to film with them. Um, and that's why we didn't end up going to some places like Victoria because, um, 
because of lockdown and things like that. So there's a lot of people from Victoria like, love the series, but where's Victoria? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, I didn't even notice that. But it, yeah, it makes sense. It was pretty um, hard to come to Victoria for a long time in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> so we were really sad we couldn't do that. But um, Season two. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed, Danny. Yep. I was really impressed with, yeah, I mean, you've mentioned the local produce with the seafood and the honey, but I mean, I was really impressed with the from scratch uh, ethic in the restaurants that you visited. You know, these are, these are not people, you know, grabbing bulk food out of the freezer. Like it was so the quality and the, the pride, the attention to detail was remarkable. And that's why their days are so long because they're getting up at six in the morning to put the stock on. You know, because all of the food that, for example, in um, the Chiem's restaurant at Gawler Palace in Gawler, like that stock is bubbling away from six o'clock. So anything with a splash of chicken stock has been boiling for like the whole day by the time it gets to your dinner. Um, One of the guys at Harvey Bay, um, at Oriental Palace in Harvey Bay, Gary, his stock is a year old so he like refreshes it every day and then at the end of the year he you know starts a new one people are making wontons and dumplings from scratch all the spring rolls are rolled by hand no one's pulling a bag out of a freezer for even vegetables and things like that like every time i cut up a head of broccoli now i think of um ernest in maury doing the same thing in his kitchen like it's all it's all it's all from scratch like because I thought this is like ex- like exposing a bit of a of a preconception in my mind, but I I was thinking you know you're in the middle of not a very big place. A lot of people are passing through just on on various road trips. It wouldn't matter if you just did some frozen foods on the side just to make it easy. Like no one's going to say anything. Like perhaps their expectations aren't too high. But these guys are doing it from scratch every day. Yeah, there's so much pride in it. And I think I had this had similar preconceptions, especially as these are restaurants with the, you know, the large menus and you just think, you know, surely they can't do everything fresh, but and yet they do. <laughs> yep, yep. There's 300 um, items on that menu and they're going to do it all fresh for you. <laughs> It's, yeah, it's super, it's super impressive and also really heartwarming. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a part of Australian culture that I'm gonna, uh, I guess you know you've helped me reappraise it, and I'm going to, uh, yeah, just I guess road appreciate trip. those restaurants more. Yeah, road You're trip. Gonna road trip. <laughs> There's so many restaurants like that. You know, I can think of two within like you know spitting distance of my house, like that I've never to like what is wrong I I need to yeah I need to fix that yeah get yourself a deep fried ice cream totally that (laughs) I won't say I'll start with that but I'll definitely finish with it um so I've seen on your bio Jennifer that you've done work as an MC and facilitator including on anti-racism events and racism is something we've talked a lot about on the podcast over the months particularly anti-Asian racism do you see what you're you're doing with this show as a part of an anti-racist project? Um, well, it certainly wasn't the first two words in the pitch when we pitched it. Um, <laughs> but, sure. But um, I think um, I think at the back of my mind and at the bottom of my heart, this is going to sound really corny, but it's something that I never not think about. Um there's a big responsibility when you're given the chance to portray people from your own culture or from cultures that are, um, you know, to either side of yours. Like you want to do a really good job, right? Like you you want the stories to be um, lovingly offered to the audience. And I think um, to be able to have six families from various parts of Asia tell their story on the ABC, um, some of them speaking in their own language, I think that does go some way to offering people the opportunity to think about how well do I know the people in my neighbourhood who don't look like me? Um, What are the things that um, I'm curious about when it comes to people who are from different parts of the world to me? 
Um, and at, at the same time, I think it gives people who are Chinese and Vietnamese and Malaysian, you know, Hakka from East Timor, a sense of pride to see someone who's like themselves and like their own family, you know, on screen. So I wouldn't go so far as to say, I think, with the six part series on ABC iView that we've solved the problem of racism. But um, but perhaps we can do that in season two. No, but um, but I do think that any kind of offering that shows people, um, you know, in their own language, in their own settings, you know, being the storytellers of their own lives. I think I hope to think that there's something there that can challenge what we think about when we think about what does it mean to be Australian? Yeah, I I think I think you're doing all of that and you know if only we could solve everything with um yeah one season or even the whole of the entertainment industry or any you know it all it needs to come from everywhere all the time but I also think you know showing some of those families that run the restaurants were the only Asian family in the community and I think showing how beloved and appreciated and part of everything they are you know with a lot of you know with a predominantly white customer base I feel like that's a, that's a really important thing to show as well. Like you do show a lot of interaction between the customers and the and the restaurant owners and, and the families. And and yeah, I mean, the, the, they've the customers have watched the kids grow up in the restaurant. You know, they talk about fe- that um, feeling like they belong. Everyone, yeah, there's just a gr- there is just a great feeling of belonging and community. And I think that that's part of the anti racist project for sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting. You know, we think about you know, there's the there's the idea that, you know, um, you love our food, so you should love us as people. And, of course, it's not as simple as that. Like just because someone eats like a crispy steak and plum sauce for lunch doesn't mean that they don't hold, you know, views that might be um, prejudiced or, you know, discriminatory towards other people. But um, one thing that um, I think in the food industry that's spoken about is the idea of, you know, what is authentic food, right? And when we see people who cook a certain food, eat food that's different to what they serve their community. I think there's something there as well that kind of makes you do a double take and go, oh, oh, so so Chinese food can mean all sorts of things. Chinese food can mean a steamed meat cake on a metal tray. Chinese food can mean braised, you know, beef with like white radish with star anise. It's, it's not just all um, sweet and sour pork and Mongolian lamb. Um, I think it just expands. If we can expand our definition of what it means to be something, I think we're already hopefully making it easier for other people to kind of live in this expansiveness, Um, whether or not they're Chinese, like just any migrant or anyone with difference, you know, if it's like, yeah, I think we need more different dishes. We need more different people. We need more different stories. And, yeah, it's, it's one of the lovely things I think that the food industry offers Australia is that um, opportunity to to try something different and to consider what it means to 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 be in this country and to to be part of it. Yeah, I think that's so articulate and eloquent and really speaks to what you've achieved in the show. Did you feel from the people that participated in it, did, you know, did they feel like they were doing something important? Were they was were they really proud to have the opportunity to air their story? I think that families all have in common this amazing humility. So I don't like n- none of them clambered for the opportunity to be like, <laughs> oh, we're going to be front and center. But I do think that the lovely thing is that after this series went up on iView is that I've heard from the families that, you know, lots of people go into the restaurants and tease them like, oh, you guys are superstars now. And, you know, (laughs) just kind of gently, you know, acknowledge that, you know, that they've been acknowledged, which is the beautiful thing. Like one of the episodes we were in Harvey Bay at um, Oriental Palace and we had the good fortune of being able to capture their 20th anniversary that night um and I think Gary who runs the restaurant who's Malaysian Chinese um you know he got really emotional talking about what the restaurant has meant to him and his family and the community you know like um people who run restaurants have um different timetables to people who don't run restaurants or work in restaurants you know so when he said that um 
you know, he apologised to his kids that, you know, he's never around and they never have dinner together except on a Monday. Like I think a lot of people working in hospitality would be like, yeah, that's that's our lives. Like, you know, we um, work really hard. Every holiday that you have is a day of work for us. And so that takes its toll on its family. And, like, everyone was in tears when when Gary said that because it's just like, you know, there's joy in having a customer, you know, love your food, but there's also a sense of guilt, I think, sometimes for the parents um, who are like, you know, we spend so many hours in the restaurant, the kids spend so many hours in the restaurant doing their homework here so that we can have a family meal together. Um, Yeah, it's, they're so humble, Danny, like it's just so humble and I think it's just really nice that, you know, we, that we were able to go in and go, hey, we, hello, we, we, we were interested in you. Tell us, tell us everything. Yeah, it's beautiful to shine a light on what they're doing. And, and yeah, like as you say, I think restaurant people are, are so embedded and busy with their restaurant life that they often don't take the time to reflect on uh, you know, what an incredible thing it is that they're doing for, for their family because a lot of these people are, you know, it's that um, common migrant story of working so hard to create opportunities for your children, um, whether it's in that business or, or outside of it. Um, and, yeah, there are sacrifices, really big sacrifices that people often make. Um, and I think they often, yeah, they just don't take the time to, to pause because there is no pause. You know, they're, they're, it's late to bed and up at six to get the stock on, as you say. So it's, a really, it's also really lovely that you gave them the opportunity um, to reflect. I think that's really lovely. Yeah. The director, mm. Linji Kong, she made a really good point when we were filming and she said that, like, none of the people who run these restaurants ever grew up hoping when they were adults that one day they'd run a restaurant. It's very different from, like, people now who are like, you know, all I want to do is, you know, run my own cafe or run my own patisserie or something. Like none of these people were like, we want to be restaurateurs when we're, we're older. It's just all um, circumstance, you know, what, what job could you get if you came to Australia in the 70s with limited English? Like Raymond from Malua Bay, he was a tailor in Hong Kong and he came over here. He's like, people here dress really casual. If I'm going to be a tailor, I'm going to starve to death. Oh uh, yeah, um, he says that. That was a great bit. <laughs> um, and it's like, so all of the, all of the people we, we met, it's just like, you know, it's, um, this is how we're going to make a better life for our kids. We'll do whatever it takes and, you know, making food, selling food, running a restaurant is what we can do with our um, dedication to hard work and our limited English skills. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of people come to Australia and their qualifications are not recognised here, so they might not be able to work in their chosen field, at least initially. And, yeah, there's a lot of those stories in hospitality. Oh, wow. Well, I just love the show and I commend it to everybody. It is um, e- like it's super easy to binge, which is what I did because the episodes are really short and you just want to see the next one <laughs> like a like a bit of a degustation. But they're also bite-sized. Like, are they, what are they, 20 minutes long? They're like 15 minutes each, so very easy to fit in, yeah. Easy to fit in, totally. Um, Jennifer, thank you so much for sharing the behind-the-scenes stories about uh, Chopsticks or Fork. It's been an absolute pleasure to chat to you you today thank you danny you're lovely and speak kindly to yourself (laughs) (laughs) i'll remember that fried ice cream will help for sure yes yes lots of it this is dirty linen and i'm danny valent we air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about hearing from different people with unique perspectives we want to hear from you as well if you have something that needs to be said about a topic Get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you. This.